Jeremy Hills. I was like rushing, trying to hurry up and get my glass before you finish. Boy, pick that mic up before you start talking to these oh, people. Okay. <laughs> oh, you ain't got to rush. So, they all here for you, man. I know, right? <laughs> First of all, thank you guys for coming. Seriously, thank you guys for coming. You, uh, the weather's bad out there. It's Tuesday. I'm sure you guys have other things that you could be doing. You got a million other places you can be, and you're here with us tonight, so I definitely want to say thank you. Um, and before we get going, it wouldn't be right if I didn't say thank you, Mary Lemons, for coming. That is my beautiful mother over there in the corner. So, Hi, Mama. <laughs> she came tonight. Um, it means a lot to me. So, yeah, yeah. let's get it. Let's get it. So... Uh, man, you've been on a journey, right? Um, you're out here doing something really important, really impactful for the community, um, but you didn't just arrive here, right? These moments of opportunity are kind of met with the level of focus that I think you've brought to your entire life. Um, and so when we pop up our heads and we see, you know, this entity that's been created, this thing that's happening just a block away from here, right. um, it can feel overnight. And I think what we want to talk about is, you know, what are the incremental steps that ultimately led uh, to this fantastic business that you're building here in Austin, Texas. But um, let's start at the beginning. Okay. You're not from Austin. I'm, I'm, now the, the cat's out the back. No, no, no. no. Um, Where's I'm not, home? I'm not from Austin. Home is um, Houston, Texas. So we got any H-Town in the building? Hey, there we go. Uh, so A-Lee a a specifically. Yeah, um, so I, I grew up in Houston. Um, so even before that, so my family is originally from Dallas. Okay. Um, my three older brothers, two of them, which are here tonight, they actually remember living in Dallas. I have no recollection of it at all. Uh, my whole life was Houston, uh, specifically A-Leaf. And uh, what I tell people is, if you don't know much about A-Leaf or Houston, if you can imagine uh, the south side of Houston in the 90s was like the wild, wild west, but just like in the inner city. So uh, it was a very interesting time, some of the best years of my life. Um, also, I mean, some pretty dangerous years too. Yeah, you know, at the same time, but that, that's that's kind of what comes with it. So, yeah, I think uh, when you were you were talking about that, and I was telling you that I was from South Central, we both laughed about it. You know, it's easy uh, to remember those times fondly, but there's a lot of people that look and sound like you and me that didn't make it out of those conditions. Uh, for so, sure. how much of that do you think shaped your your drive? Obviously, I'm sure your brothers had a lot to do with that because you don't just get to be one of three without taking your lumps. See, that's the thing. It's a fourth one. He, he, didn't, he wasn't able to make it tonight. No, I'm, I'm the youngest. I have three older brothers, and all of them were older than me and bigger than me. You can imagine how that went. Like, it, yeah. No, you, you want what? You want to play the game? Get out of here. Like, you, you know what I mean? So, no, no, no. My brothers, they kept me in line, smacked me around a little bit. But they, they um, one of the things that I was afforded that a lot of people in that kind of situation weren't, wasn't was that I had men in my life who loved me who were around me and were examples for what to do and what not to do. I, I kind of look at my life and I'm like, I was privileged. Right. Simply because if, if life is a test, right, I never had a multiple choice test. All of my tests were true or false because I had three examples go before me with every decision I made. So every time a decision came to me, it wasn't the, even if it was the first time that I lived it, it wasn't the first time I experienced it. Right. I seen Mike Jr. make a decision very similar to this kind of predicament. I seen Brandon do the same. I seen Tony do the same. And I seen how it played out for all three of them. So then when it was my turn to make a similar decision, it's like, yeah, it's not like A, B, C, or D, or E. It's true or false. It's, I just got one or two options. Then not be out there and making the wrong decision when you already got the example. Right. It's, <laughs> it's kind of hard to forgive you at that point. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we talked a little bit about that. Tell us a little bit about mom and dad. Who are the people that that really gave you everything that you needed to be this person here today? I like to believe at one point they were in love. All right. I didn't grow up with my father. Yeah. So that's, well, Mary's everything. Absolutely. You know what I mean? But I, I like to believe at one point they were, they were really in love. But um, my experience in a single parent household was, um, Imagine like uh, you get this example of how to push through and make shit work regardless of what cards you're dealt. So when we talk about my determination or my focus or whatever it is we're going to credit me with, yeah, I've seen some real decisions have to get made. Absolutely. I've seen 
do we eat or do we put gas in the car? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about where do we put the next collective, yeah, all right. I can probably handle that one. <laughs> yeah, I think that one's a little easier. <laughs> That's good stuff. Um, let's focus on mom for a second, because first of all, we appreciate you coming out. Um, but I also grew up in a single family house, uh, excuse me, single, single parent household, and some of the things that you talk about that you've seen, um, what were the things that you observed your mom sacrificing to make sure that y'all had it with y'all? Time. Most valuable asset we have. She gave me all of it. All of it. Wow. Immediate. I don't got to think about that. Time. She, she didn't miss a game. She was at practice. I'm talking about practice, Let me talk about practice. She, she, didn't, she didn't miss a game. She would be at practice. I don't know why I was in, like, the school play, but at one point she was at the play. I was, I was in the nutcracker. Hold on, we didn't talk about I this. was in the nutcracker. I was about to say, like, what, what role story. did you play in the nutcracker, Doc? I was a tin man. I was like the, I'm dead serious. I was a tin man in there. But, but regardless of what it is, she pushed me outside of my comfort zone. Um, I mean, she made me, school was easy for me my entire life, and that's, and that's the truth. <laughs> so... In the state of Texas, like most states, they have a, a bare minimum requirement that you have to make grades-wise in order to play sports. Um, my household had a different requirement. That was not what that requirement was. And then on top of that, based off of what my mother thought you should be making in the class, which basically, and she pulling this out of nowhere. This is based off of nothing. It's just what she think you should make. If you weren't making that, then she pulling you. You're not playing. So like when I, when I think about like, her dedication to seeing me and my brother's success is, is unwa is, was unwavering and still unwavering. And she literally uh, dedicated her life to making sure that we had the opportunities that she did not have. Um, mom, I hope I'm not sharing too much up here. You let me know. But my mom never, she never dated after my father. We are grown now, so you can imagine my parents were split from the time I was in kindergarten. She never dated after my father. You know what I mean? That's crazy. Yeah, that's wild. Dedication to the family, I, head down. I can't imagine it. As a, as a man, I literally can't even imagine it. So when I, I cannot. But, <laughs> got that dog in him. <laughs> but, got that dog in him. But, no, but what I'm saying is like, like, the older I get, the more I appreciate the sacrifices she made, the more I start to understand the decisions that, that she made that I didn't understand coming up, right? Absolutely. Um, so we grew up in, in, like a lot of my section was government housing. And so the government helped you with your housing costs, right? And, and you can imagine what kind of neighborhood this is. And for lack of a better term, we called it the ghetto, right? And my mother used to have this saying, she would say, and she would be like, we're in the ghetto, but we're not of the ghetto. And like, I didn't even know what that meant, right? But I, I, I grew to know what that meant. Yeah. I grew to understand that like, I shaped my world up here. Absolutely. And, and my circumstance, my current circumstance is, is just that, it's just current. It's not. Mama's handing out free game before. Oh, I mean, cool bro, daily. School was easy. Homeschool was the hard part. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of people that, I heard some chuckles, but in the ghetto, but not of the ghetto is a yeah. very powerful thing. There's a crab in the bucket mentality that comes along with those sorts of neighborhoods that if I'm not going nowhere, neither are you. 100%. So when you talk about a household full of talented athletes um, gaining national recognition, um, tell us a little bit about that transition away from academics and school being easy to watching the older brothers start to have that sort of success and how that drove you to yeah. get, get in line and get ready to go do what you were going to do at the university level. Yeah, so I, I come from a, from a football family. Uncles played. Um, my dad played professionally. Um, all three of my brothers were really good. Uh, the brother that's third in line, so closest to age to me, was um, in his high school senior recruiting class, he was the number six rated athlete in America. So he was one of the best athletes America had ever seen. You know, he, he went on to have an amazing career. He won the 2005 national championship that UT loves, and then he went on and won a Super Bowl, played 10 years in the NFL, right? So uh, for, try following that act, first of all. I, I, but, think, I think as you described it the first time we talked, uh, you, you described it as literal buckets and bathtubs full of oh, offered letters. Oh, no, no, seriously. <laughs> like, people, like, you think it's a joke. Like, 
I remember actual tubs of recruiting letters coming in the house for him, like tubs. Like the mailman would come, you know, you, and it, it got like all the little gray mailboxes yeah. over there by the, by the pool and the, the soda machine. So the mail's not going to fit in there. So they would like come knock on the front door and be like, hey, we got to actually bring this mail to your unit. And it would be tubs of letters from every single university in America that wanted him to come play football or basketball or both there, right? So uh, watching him go through his uh, college and, and recruiting process throughout high school, I was able to see myself there, which on a whole different topic, that's why I believe representation is one of the most powerful things that young people can ever have like see, access to is because yourself. you can see yourself there. No, we allowed to clap. That's, yeah, we can clap. clap. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, the ability to emulate based on known examples. Exactly. And um, again, kind of given that origin, yeah. um, few and far between. So brothers out there killing it. Yep. You get a chance to be a part of that recruitment experience as he's going through it. How do you, top rated athlete in Houston now, they, they make yeah. them. Yeah, we do. How does the University of Texas get a hold of someone like you? So I was committed to Texas probably when I was 14. Not because I like signed a letter or anything, but again, living vicariously through Tony's experience where that same athlete at 18, um, now for all my real football fans, here we go. So we're talking in the year of Nick Saban at LSU, Urban Meyer at Utah. Um, we're thinking Mac is still at Texas, uh, Stoops is at OU. Like, this is the era that we're talking about. All of these guys came to the south side of Houston and sat on that old couch and tried to convince Mary about Tony. And my mother being who she was, she would make me sit in those same recruiting meetings so that I could see it and hear it and, and understand uh, what was real and what was bullshit. You know, and I'm 13. No, it's, it's my Imagine me sitting in the living room with Nick Saban. My mom looking at me like, you got anything to ask him? I'm like, <laughs> Mama, he's not here for me. Today. Like, <laughs> sure, what'd you eat for lunch? Like, I don't, you know what I mean? But, but um, it was important because I also got a chance. Uh, Tony, in the third round of the playoffs in his senior year in high school, was dealing with a shoulder injury, so he popped some painkillers for it, goes out and play in a, in a football game that he probably shouldn't have played in, and uh, he ends up tearing his LCL, his MCL, his ACL. He developed nerve damage and drop foot in his leg, and he couldn't walk for, like, for a year and a half. You want to know what happened to those tubs of letters? Did they there were no them? more letters. We couldn't get people to return a call anymore. All of a sudden, it was, it was buddy, buddy. They called, and this was before we were texting and everything, so they calling daily on the house phone, daily. Now, all of a sudden, when we call back. No answer. Oh, they answer an assistant of an assistant, but you ain't getting through no more. Yeah, you're not getting coached no more. Yeah. yeah. And he not coming on his couch no more. We were just we were just eating spaghetti together. You told me an interesting story in preparation for this, and I, I think it's important context. Um, so you, you, you gave the era. Coaches were at different places than we know them to be historically. Um, one coach in particular had a, had a job that he was trying yeah. to tell the rest of the world he was keeping. Oh, yeah. You want to get into that? It's a, my mom get heated on this one. Okay. So <laughs> sorry, mom. Uh, Nick Saban is at LSU. There's rumors that Nick Saban's gonna take a job for the Miami Dolphins. Nick Saban then comes back into our household. My mother looks at him dead in his eyes, like I'm looking at you right now, Drew, and she says, "Are you taking a job for the Miami Dolphins?" He looks my mama dead in his in her eyes. She's, "That is absolutely false. I will be here for all four years that Anthony is here. The next week." ESPN ticker breaking news. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> the next, was like seven days later, I was like, yo. That lie was so smooth. I wasn't used to people lying like that. I wasn't used to somebody looking you dead in your face and lying to you. You know what I mean? And, and, but it was, a, it was an amazing lesson. Mm -hmm. Take everything at face value. Take it all at face value and understand that what you're, the world that you're about to enter is one of commerce and business. 100%. And I think a lot of people in that situation, mom should get heated because at that point, people are trying to manipulate you in a certain decision. And they're manipulating her baby. That's different. Like, I'm a father of two. I can only imagine. Like, it's, it's, I don't get upset a lot, but around them, over them, yeah. So okay. it's, I can understand that piece. But um, to, to my experience, now fast forward four years later, oh, Tony was all right, by the way. Like I said, national championship, 
So, but, yeah, people are, I always say that, and they're like, yo, what happened to the guy Tony? Tony like, changed positions. Yeah, like it was like, it was like a, a movie that I forgot to finish writing. They're like, what happened to him? Like, yeah. He ended up getting to Texas. He couldn't really run too far, so they uh, put on 50 pounds. They switched his position from tight end to left tackle. But was playing offensive line. He turned out to be pretty good at it. Became an All-American, had a great career. So, yeah, that, it don't always work out like that, but it, it worked out for him. One of the famous big uglies, everybody. Yeah. Um, but, again, his experience. Now, fast forward four years later, my turn Short to be time. recruited. I'm no dummy. Now, all of a sudden, Nick Saban has on a red shirt with a white A on it. Urban Meyer has on a blue shirt with a gator on it. And they're saying the same shit. They're saying the same thing they said four years ago. Like they forgot that they had told Yeah, I'm like, you don't remember me, do you? <laughs> yeah, so when it was my turn, um, I felt like, like most of my life, I was ahead of the game a little bit. Yeah. I kind of knew what to expect. I knew what was rhetoric. I knew who I couldn't and could believe. And more than anything, instead of getting upset about it, I more so just thought strategic with it. Like, okay, uh, I know he's lying, but how can this help me? Yeah. And, and – um, yeah, it came down to the University of Miami and the University of Texas. And I actually chose the University of Miami. I haven't told many people. I chose the University of Miami, and I got ready to sign my letter of intent. And I kid you not, my mom did not want me to go there. I was, I was a little bit of a knucklehead uh, growing up. Uh, of her children, I think I, I, got in a, I got in some, yeah. Um, and she just did not want an 18-year-old me in Miami, which I have no idea why she would not want me in Miami at 18. But uh, she, and my mother's a very strong woman, but she, I, I can go as far to say that she pleaded for me not to make that decision. And I was gonna make it anyway. And uh, unfortunately, what, I, what, what ended up changing my mind or being a big contributing factor to what changed my mind was um, one of their players had got murdered execution style mm -hmm. and they found out that he was involved with some other Miami business and um, yeah that, I was like ah all of a sudden mom's decision making <laughs> not, not even it, it, like that could have happened anywhere right but it happened there mm -hmm. you know and I was like you know what let me let me really look at Texas as as hard as I probably should and I was more so I always knew Texas was where I should have went but I was trying to get out of Tony's shadow it's tough, man. The kid was fucking good. Like he was really good. Like you know what I mean? Like I mean, the best era of University of Texas football. Yeah, what's arguably. the odds of that, bro? Like <laughs> he's good. They're great. Like you know what I mean? They don't lose. They won a Big Twelve championship seventy to three. That is not football. I don't know what that is, but but that's what I'm saying. So trying to like carve out my own name, yeah. I was like, I'm going on the other side of the country. I'll figure it out over there and kind of make my name for myself. But no, I, I chose Texas uh, ultimately because I trusted the character of Mac Brown. Fantastic. So you're on the 40 Acres. Yeah. Um, you're out here making a difference academically. You're handling your business. You're playing. Not game. always. Well, you know. I was no, gonna, no, no, no. I, I mean, gonna give you, I'm going to give you a little bit more. Yeah, I don't want to lie, though. Man, my first class at UT was cultural anthropology. My boy, I know Antonio's in here, and I seen Greg in here. Y'all know where cultural anthropology is. Bro, I did not go to that class. I just didn't go. I physically did not go to Still that class. Still don't know what's in the curriculum. Man, listen, it was the study of rocks. <laughs> Who put me in this class? No disrespect to anybody that loves rocks, but I'm just like... Oh. I happen to love concrete and rocks. Don't, don't, don't play with me. Man. I apologize. But <laughs> the thing is, is that it was, a freshman, it was a freshman introduction class. And this is when I started to understand like disparity and how it works and systems and everything else. Everybody in this class is a freshman like me, mm -hmm. incoming freshman like me. The professor's asking questions that I don't even know what you're asking. I can't give you the answer because I actually don't know what you're asking. And there's people around me that are raising their hands with the answer. Confidently. They did not get the same education I got. Right. This is the truth. I got to UT and I started realizing all high schools aren't equal. We, we can't be learning the same thing. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I, I fancy myself pretty intelligent until that day. And then for the first time, I had ever felt small in class, mm -hmm. right? And unfortunately, at that point, I didn't know how to overcome a, a mental hurdle, right? Right. All of my hurdles had been uh, opponents, football, right? right? Track, 
basketball, whatever. Um, but this time I, I had my first mental challenge. Like, I don't understand the curriculum. And um, I remember I was sitting next to uh, one of my boys, and I was like, bro, I don't know what the fuck's going on. And he was like, man, me either. I might not even come back. And I was like, well, you can do that? <laughs> he was talking about dropping the class. I thought he meant we just Ferris Bueller's day off. Like, I thought we were just going to, like, not come. So I followed through with that plan. First class I ever took at UT, I made an actual zero. An actual zero. My very first grade at Texas was a zero. And um, Mac Brown pulled me in his office, and he's like, it seems like you're having a tough time transitioning here, which I was. The culture was different. This was no longer, like, uh, the south side of Houston. Right. This was a different ball game. For the first time, people, not everybody in the room looked like me. Um, that was intimidating to me. Uh, obviously, I didn't feel that smart. I, I went from school being easy to school being the hardest fucking thing in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a shock to me. Football, I'm no longer the best on the field. I'm scratching for any sort of playing time, you know, as a true freshman. And uh, I called my mom, and I was like, man, I'm coming home. She's like, what are you, what, what, are you sick? Are you hurt? What, what, what do you mean you're coming home? She's trying to check the holiday schedule. She's like, what are you talking about? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to U of H or TSU or something. I got to figure it out, but I'm, I'm coming home. I don't, I don't want to be here anymore. And um, she, she said, let me call you back. She called me back a couple hours later, and she was like, listen, if you want to come home, I'll come get you right now. You can come home. But? But that means you quit. And I just want to hear you say it. Say I quit. Man, we need to sign mom up for home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she's phenomenal. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a prideful guy. And I sat in my you? dorm. <laughs> right. I sat in my dorm with like tears in my eyes. Like, can't even get the words out. And in that tough moment, I like, I'll call you back. Figure this shit out. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I can't, I cannot say I quit. I can't, that, I can't embody that. I can't take, I can, I can take, I don't want to do this anymore. I can take, I've grown out of this. I'm moving on to the next chapter. It's hard. I quit. I can't do that. And, and so, um, yeah, ironically enough, two semesters later and for the rest of my time at Texas, I made the uh, Big 12 all academic team while playing football at the University of Texas. Kept a GPA of a 3.3 or higher my, my whole time there. And it was just a matter of, of prioritizing my time better, um, getting study buddies and tutors, whatever it took, right. whatever it took. And, and so that was, um, that was a good lesson to learn. That was a good lesson to learn because that's kind of what the rest of life is too. It's like you just figure out a way. Just because the answer doesn't come easy or just because the answer doesn't come quick does not mean that you move on. You stay there in the shit until you figure it out. The standard is the standard. The standard is the standard. So you lock in, everything's going the way that it should be going. You're on the field, you're getting playing time. Yeah. Tell us about how in, in my head, I'm already spending my NFL money. Let's go. No, like I go to sleep at night. I, I watch the Steelers play, so I'm watching my brother play, and I'm laying in my dorm thinking of the stuff I'm buying. Like I can't wait to get to the league. Like that's every day I go to sleep happy that I'm rich. Two years from now, like you, you was manifesting, manifesting. I was, li I was in the metaverse. I was living it. It was happening. I was, it was real. I, now I woke up back with forty bucks in that account. Yep. Can't wait for this scholarship check to hit. You need but Bevo bucks now. I'm telling you, them Bevo bucks. I'm eating the same thing every day. But I'm t when I go to bed at night, oh, I'm rich. You're rich, rich. Y'all just don't know it yet. Like, but I'm rich. Um, and and uh, it didn't it didn't go that way for me. It didn't go that way for me. And why is that? Tell us about what ultimately led to the yeah. To I, ironically enough, man, how about this? My senior year in college, senior night, we're playing TCU, and um, scoring a touchdown. I, I broke my leg. Um, I got hit pretty low, and it's just clean hit. It's just football. Uh, I, I broke my proximal fib ripped up my ATFL, and developed um, a slight case of arthritis in the insertion point between the calcaneus and the Achilles tendon. And so my ankle would blow up whenever I tried to put a shoe on. 
So I couldn't walk or wear shoes for a very long time. And bones heal, ligaments take a little bit longer. So um, it was the rest of my senior season then, and then I came back and performed at the Pro Day and did pretty well. Uh, I'll say this, I ran 4.38 on a broke leg, which was, you know, hey, yes, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll tell you that, I'll wear that one with pride. But um, <laughs> no, when I did, when, later that evening, ibuprofen start wearing off and you get over to the field and, and whenever you, the thing about the NFL is they're going to they're gonna find out if you hurt. So they knew that I had sustained that injury. So they had me doing additional field drills by myself for like 50 minutes and I, I couldn't hold up. Like my lateral movement was gone and the ibuprofen's wearing off. And, it's getting and, painful. Yeah, it's starting to get painful and it's starting to swell up. And it took me about 14, almost 16 more months before I gained all my lateral movement back and, and everything like that. And um, yeah, I had so much scar tissue down there. Like it was, it was pretty bad. It was bad for a while. Yeah, so 16 months after the pro day, yeah. the draft is coming gone. They're already on to the next 16 months. So we're back You're 12 back. months from this time and then a new draft. Yeah, it's, yeah. Was that, was that the end of the? That the, was the, the end of the beginning part. right there. So yeah. um, actually, I got a, a workout out in Seattle. And so I flew out to Seattle and just didn't, I, I wasn't the same. Let's just call it what it was. I wasn't the same. And um, yeah, I, I remember leaving and getting going to the, the airport in Seattle to, to fly back to Houston. And for the first time, I felt like helpless. Because when you're going through shit when you're a kid, everybody cares. When you're going through things in college, your family really cares. When you're an adult going through anything, like the number of people that have the time to coddle or ask you, are you okay? Those numbers get lower and lower and lower the older in life you get. Right? It's an isolated space. Right. You're you're a single arbiter. Right, 100%, right? So um, didn't know who to talk to, didn't know what to do, all of those things. And I remember sitting, this is the second, this is probably the second, y'all, y'all listening, it's like, damn, this kid's a crybaby. Like, was, I'm sitting there in the airport, tears in my eyes once again, and um, trying to, to figure out, like, um, okay, football is done. What am I supposed to do with my life? And... Um, M that pops, was tough. And then M pops Tony Robbins. No, so. not Tony Robbins. <laughs> it was uh, Joel Osteen. There it is. Yeah, <laughs> Pastor Joel. Um, I, don't, I don't even remember downloading the app, but I had his app on my phone, and I clicked it, and the first thing that popped up, I kid you not, it was a sermon, and the title of the sermon was, When One Dream Dies, Dream Another Dream. And I listened to that thing on repeat, Seattle to Texas is a four-hour and 27-minute flight. And I listened to that 45-minute sermon just over and over and over again. And by the time that flight took off and landed back in Austin, I was done feeling sorry for myself. It was time to get to work. So um, I was like, all right, let's figure it out. Okay. So you back at it again? Back at it again. Feeling great? Not necessarily. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Not necessarily. Yeah. Still maybe a little unsure. Yeah. So we pick up the phone. Who do we call? Not, so this is the thing. I was, um, I'm talking to Tony, and he's living his dream. He's on like year six or seven in the NFL. I'm like, this guy, like, you know what I mean? But, um, he's, been in, he's been in my imaginary. Yeah, body. yeah. So uh, I'll back up a little bit. Um, Brandon, I hope you don't mind me sharing this. Um, when I was 14, um, my brother Brandon went to prison, and um, he got sentenced to 25 years. And um, violent crime. like, please don't give me no extra time. <laughs> I don't need no extra 15, time. 15, 25, boy, you're gone. You, you, you're not here, sir. Your room's empty. You are not outside. We use your room for clothes. <laughs> uh, um, Damn. No, no, right. I'm just, we, we, I'm playing. Oh, I love him. Uh, but no, I, I'll say this, though. And, and, and Brent has even said this himself. It's like, without going too far here, um, the prison system doesn't always work the way it's designed to, but it worked for him. And the person that went in and the person that came out were two completely different people. And ironically enough, the 23-year-old me who came back to Austin with nobody was the same time he got out and he had to start life over. And we did it together. That's amazing. We did it together. We, um, 
we literally both uh, applied for jobs at CarMax at the same time. Yeah, we, we literally did it together. Anybody else, show of hands, anybody else in here ever sold used cars? You ain't, you ain't really working until you sell, there you go. Sam, girl. That's a hustle Until right you there. sell some used car, until you can convince somebody that this 96 Hyundai is, what is the need. one. You hear me? The one. Not the black one. Because they seen that on the website when, when they got here, we didn't have it. But this purple one? <laughs> until you sell a used car, I don't want to hear it. But, um, Facts. No, uh, I think God needed. God knew exactly what I needed, and I needed my brother. Okay. Uh, I, I, uh, Tony was he. He had already started his family. He was in the middle of that NFL grind. My other brother Mike, same thing. He had his family. He was in Dallas. My mom is in Houston still, and um, I had. It's like I got something returned to me that I didn't know I needed, which was like that guidance again from the presence of a man in my life that I trusted, could be vulnerable with, listened to, could learn from, had known me my whole life, like that type of thing. Right. And um, yeah, we, we, we literally were roommates together in, in a part. One month, he was short on rent because he wasn't working because he was sick. We didn't know what he was sick with, but he had a lump in his throat and laid on the couch the whole time. I just put down the down payment from rooms to go for this couch. He won't stop laying on it. I'm like, bro, go lay in your bed. Go, you're gonna get the couch sick. <laughs> then everybody that comes here is gonna get sick. That, was the, that almost ended us. That almost ended us, but we made it through that. Hey, rooms to go ain't playing with the interest rates. Yeah, I'm telling you, at all. <laughs> I can't return the couch either, got it sick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're in the job market. You got your brother back. Yeah. When does the first inkling of Jeremy, the entrepreneur, come from? Uh, I, I, didn't, I wasn't there yet. I, um, I'm still trying to figure some things out, yeah. right? But I need money. Um, I'm working at CarMax. I'm killing it, man. I'm talking $140 a car sale, $30 for an appraisal. Get them appraisals, by the way, y'all. If you ever I'm, end up listen, there, that's where the money's at. I'm, I'm like that. I'm like, I'm, nobody's slinging these used cars like me. But um, <laughs> I, I needed to compete again. I wanted to compete again. I studied kinesiology and anatomy at UT, and um, I was one of the few people I assume that actually put their degree to, to, to use for their career. But I, um, I started working, well actually I interviewed for an orthopedic medical device sales company, and they liked me, but didn't feel like I knew uh, what I needed to know enough. So they gave me like three books to read and some, some study material, and, and Brandon can attest to this. I, I literally went like note cards, da 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 da, like, uh, he's, he was like, man, I feel like I'm watching you become a doctor. Like, I, uh, I, I study, I, I, I locked in. And this was one of the first times that I, like, locked in mentally. You know what I mean? Uh, I say second, because, you know, I did fail that first class. I took a UT. But nine months later, I interviewed for the same position. Knocked it out the park. Yep. Worked with this company for two and a half years. Um, went from being the assistant of an assistant to eventually... Um, having a territory that stretched over 11 hospitals and surgery centers from Cedar Park, Round Rock, North Austin, Pflugerville, and Georgetown. And uh, my accounts were some of the biggest accounts in Texas. And so... Um, so now you're a regional <coughs> sales leader. Making some bread. I mean, some real bread. Actual yeah, and I'm money 23, 24 almost, you know what I mean? Making, mm -hmm. making some bread now. And, um, and that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me because it did two things for me. It made me realize that I never loved football the way I thought I did. I loved the idea of being rich. And I knew I was really good at this thing, and it paid well when people are good at it at the high level. Therefore, this is, Therefore, this is what I love. Yep. No, I don't actually love this at all. And, and getting money, I always say I wish everybody can get the all the money that they ever wish they could have so that they could realize that's not the answer. Because it wasn't until, because I've been broke my whole life. Right. So when you're broke, you always think the answer to all the problems is just, I just don't got money. But this, no, no, money would probably make this problem like hide a little bit easier, or hide a little bit more, but you still have other things that you need to work on internally. You have other areas that you need to develop in that you haven't even been paying attention to because all you focus on is the lack of finances, um, which ultimately is why, you know, 
people don't develop in the other areas that they should, so then they end up getting the money, and what do they do next? Well, with scarcity mentality, you don't understand how to manage it, it goes away. Boom. Exactly. So why is that? They had a skill set, and they focused on a skill set that made money. They never developed anything else. It was never a, and then what? So anyways, I made a little money. I moved to Fifth Street. Oh, man, I moved to Fifth Street. What year was this? 2013, 2014. Let me tell you. Fifth Street was still Fifth oh, Street. Oh, my gosh. I'm having a good time. I'm having a good time. <laughs> no kids yet? Hold on, show of hands. Who was here back then? Hey, okay, I seen some of y'all. I think out I there. seen some of y'all out there actually. <laughs> no, uh, Antonio remembers this. We um, everybody would drive to my apartment. We would park our cars, and then I'll jump in. Uh, you know, uh, Uber. This, this is, is like year one of Uber, by the way. This is how we live in. Okay, I was calling the Uber black trucks, <laughs> two to three of them, and I'd tell them just stay outside. I, you know, pass the five minute ticket. And I was, I can I get to you? <laughs> I'll get to you. I'm going to take care of you. And me and my boys would be upstairs having a shooting a full Drake video in the apartment. I just, I can't even imagine. Oh, what a time. On a whole what a time. Like oh, my gosh. And so then we come downstairs and we would catch the Uber from this side of his street to this side of his street. It was pointed ways. But, um, <laughs> um, but, but no, we, uh, that, was, that was the era where uh, I tried to fulfill a void with partying. Yeah. So I'm partying, I'm turning up, I'm drinking, I'm doing all the things, I'm killing it at work, and I am miserable, like actually miserable. Right. And I didn't realize I was miserable until I found myself, like Tony and them actually enjoyed what they were doing, so they was like, yeah, actually I'm not going out tonight. I'm going to go, oh, okay, well, I'm by myself. Mm -hmm. And I was still out doing the same thing. And I'm like, oh, man, this, this actually might not be good. I don't think this is fun anymore. It's, yeah, perfect attendance in the streets, yeah. but perfectly miserable perfectly miserable and um i i couldn't even watch football anymore because i would get upset i would get upset hearing announcers call the names of players that i was waxing their whole life i've been knowing them since we were 10 how is he making money playing football right this guy's not good but you know what i mean like he's actually not good you know but football's so circumstantial that's a whole different kind of conversation but jealousy I was so jealous that I can't even enjoy something that's been such a big part of my life as a fan and as a, as a just a viewer because I'm empty. Right. And, and I think that that's, the, that's what needs to fill the void. It's not that at all. It's other areas I need to work on. And so, then you thought it was money. Yeah, it wasn't but, socioeconomic. But now I got, I, got, I got a little money now. I'm sending a little money home. I'm feeling, in my hood, I made it. If, you have, if you're making enough money to send money home, where I'm from, you made it. That's like, that, that's it. You send money home to your people? Oh, you taking care of Facts. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So um, I realized it wasn't that. And I sat with me, and one of the best things I ever did was just sit with myself and start trying to figure out when am I happy? And I started there, like, when am I happy? And I realized I'm actually happy when I'm helping younger people understand how to prepare for the game. It's not even playing the game. It's, I enjoy the preparation. Right. I enjoy getting ready for a war. Like, you know what I mean? I enjoyed that process. And that's honestly what I missed about football was the locker room. Mm -hmm. I miss the jokes, the, 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 the bonds, the time, right? the camaraderie, exactly, the entire thing. And so um, I took a little bit more time, and I actually went, I would go back to Houston to my old high school, and I was just volunteering my time. I was training the high school athletes for free, just for free. And my coaches, were, my old high school coaches would let me do it. And, and they actually, it worked. Those guys started getting scholarship offers and everything, right? Okay. So I was like, man, I'm, I'm actually pretty good at this. And I uh, made a pretty impulsive decision that, Mary wasn't very approved. She wasn't, she wasn't rocking. So let's talk about that. So you're doing well. Yeah. The economics are there. You've changed your situation fundamentally. Um, you're now enjoying yourself. You found yeah. joy. Uh, you call mom and tell her what exactly? I should have called her. It would have saved a trip. <laughs> I, um, I got in a car and drove from Austin to Houston. And um, I drove to a, I told my mom I was going to pick her up from work. 
And she's like, I'll just meet you there. What do you want? Why are you here? Like, I, I'm surprised her at this point. I was like, I'm in Houston. Da, da, da. And um, we went to a Chipotle off of Kirkendall on the north side where she was working. And we're sitting at a two-seater table. You know, outside Chipotle, is like the little two-seater. All right, we're sitting at a two-seater table. And I'm like, all right. She's like, what is it? She's like, I don't know what she think I'm going to tell her, but she is excited, right? And I'm like, all right. I think I know what I'm doing with my life. She was like, what are you talking about? You have the, you work with the, the medical company. You're doing really well. I said, nah, actually, I, I just quit. Um, I know exactly what I'm going to do. She was like, what are you going to do? I'm going to train all the athletes in the NFL. Skirt. What? She looked at me like, like she's seen a ghost, like an actual ghost, right? And... Um, I'm looking for, like, why are you not as turned up the way that I am? Like, why are you, you know? Because this is my best friend. This is, this is my best friend. Uh, Tony is four and a half years older than me. We're the closest in age. So when he left the house, it was just me and her. So all of my high school years, I went from being, like, one of three or four at any moment to just a single Basically child. Basically getting that only a, child. A single child. It was just me and her, right? So this is, we've become, like, outside of mother's son, this is, like, my best friend. And um, I'm talking to her, and my best friend is not happy for me. You know, she uh, she's like, you're going to do what? I say, yeah, I'm going to, like, NFL athletes are going to pay me money to train them for the NFL. She looked and said, have you talked to God about this? I said, oh, yeah. Like, what, what are you talking about? Like, you know what I mean? And, um... And I get it. In retrospect, I definitely get it. She loves me a lot. So this was just more like feeling like this was an impulsive, not really thought through decision and just trying to tell me like, hey, think this through, right? Um, and admittedly, if, yeah, but I mean, but if I'm being honest too, it was, it was some fear there. Yeah. She, now the fear was rooted in love, but the fear still existed. And a lot of times that fear, if you, if you allow it to, will handicap you from making any decision that you need to make to get to where you want to be. Um, so I leave that conversation. Um, I'm driving all the way back to Austin now, not as excited as when I was driving back to Houston, right? And I'm like, all of a sudden the drive is like very long. And I'm like not having a good time. I'm very upset. Because um, I'm, I'm like, why don't she believe in this the way that I believe in this, right? And uh, my brother, my oldest brother, Mike, just happened to call me. We always talked about football together on the phone, UT, all these other things. He's the biggest UT fan I ever met in my life. He knows, like, eight-year-olds that are considering Texas for, like, like I kid you not. It's, it's a damn shame that that's No, nah, he's literally, like, he's the guy in the, the type room, like, writing stuff, like, I'm hearing that he may have a cold. I'm like, but how do you know this guy has a cold? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? But... Uh, he called me and we're talking ball and then he could tell something was wrong with me. He asked what it was. I told him exactly what happened. And then he was like, Jay, I'm going to tell you this. If you got a dream, go for it. Just do it. I can do it. What's the worst that could happen? You absolutely fail. Then what? You get up. You don't got no kids. You don't got no wife. Do it. Do it now or stop talking about it. And then, like, I was, like, all cheery again, right? And the rest, of the, the rest of the ride home, I was thinking, how did I go from being cheery to sad to cheery just based off of conversations? I, I didn't like that roller coaster. Yeah, how did they move me so and, much? And um, I haven't really shared this with anybody, but this is actually how my career in this field got started. Um, I immediately heard a voice. I, I heard God tell me, I did not give the vision to them. Stop asking them. And that's the last time I ever asked anybody for anything. Let's sit on that for a second. Because I think there's a tremendous amount of power in allowing whatever that thing is for you is God. For some of us, it's clarity. For us, it's just a moment to sit back and allow what's happening inside of you to be manifested through the things that you are actually trying to achieve. And that's... That's amazing. So you said you, you just stopped asking for advice after that. I never asked for advice again. I still don't to this day. Only time I'm, whenever I'm talking to somebody in a field that, have, that has more experience than I, I seek wise counsel. Right. So when I'm talking to them, I'm more so asking how they did something. I don't want them telling me how to do it. If I have an issue, a problem, something that I'm str struggling or wrestling with, I ask them about their experiences. 
and then I allow them to talk, and I pick up what I need, and I move on. Uh, that that works for me. Uh, I don't know if that works for others, but yeah, I, I don't I don't ask for too much advice. There we go. Okay, so here we are. Fast forward to the early seeds yeah. of the business. Oh, that's fun. Let's that's get fun. into it. So how did this come about? I, I did mean, the dumbest thing in the world, man. <laughs> Worst business plan in the actual world. I took all the money that I saved up from uh, the orthopedic medical device sales company. I called up my old teammates and people I com competed against in college and knew from the league. And then I jumped on a plane unannounced to different cities. So like, Drew, let's say you play for, at that time, the San Diego Chargers. I would call you and be like, Drew, I'm in San Diego. You got time for lunch? You'd be like, yo, my boy's in town. Yeah, 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 I got time for lunch. And then when we sat down, I would pitch you Cold and come pitch in and train with me in the off season. I did this 16 times at 16 different NFL franchises. The next off season came. I had zero athletes. I wasted all of the money. <laughs> like, all of it was gone. Like Just all of it. Bro, I took out a speedy loan. No, it was bad. I wasted all the money. There's no more money. <laughs> I wasted. It's gone. Yes. I thought I was investing. No, sir. That's not investing. That is spending. Investing without a plan is squandering. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and then I ended up getting two athletes, two. And it was simply because they were already in Austin and needed somewhere to work out. It had nothing to do with me. Could have saved 16 round trips. And the money. <laughs> but... Um, uh, ironically enough, this is when I started to learn that you don't want to get rich quick. You want to master a craft. Absolutely. You want to be able to lock in and focus on something and be proud of your work. And kid you not, I started locking into my process, figuring out, figuring out what my process was, figuring out what my methodology was, which it ended up being centered around just longevity, performance, and uh, those buckets of training and how they positively impact results for athletes. But um, over the years, two athletes became four, four became eight, eight became 16, and, and currently uh, we work with well over 100, 150 pro athletes across all baseball, basketball, football, all professional sports. So uh, it, it worked out. And ironically enough, all 16 that I visit became one of our <laughs> athletes. Now, where was Tony, you ask? Still in the NFL, not working with me. <laughs> How about that? Uh oh. Oh. Uh. <laughs> well, you never even told me he was doing it. <laughs> How you not go pitch Tony? You pitched everybody else? He didn't pitch me. He didn't, he didn't fly to Houston or drive. <laughs> He's supposed to know. <laughs> Did you think? He thought I was just training to be doing something? Like, but, um, but, but no, Tony even, Tony, Tony became, uh, I tell they laugh. People are like, what happened to your brother? What was your brother? I was like, yeah, he actually, he was like athlete number like 19. It's like, really? I said, yeah, I did not give him a discount either. Like, he, yeah. Yesterday's price and it's today's not price. today's price. <laughs> but, um, no, that part was, that, that, that part was, was fun. Um, I ended up learning a lot through the process. Um. For the entrepreneurs out there in the crowd, tell us a little bit about your first experience beyond the actual informal pitches. Yeah. When you had to go secure funding. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that as a first-time entrepreneur, somebody who's really experiencing that for the first time, because that's where I feel like I cut my teeth as a senior professional in, in the space. So, and that's always a hard one. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know how to, I, I was scared to try to secure funding. I, I didn't want to owe anybody money if something didn't work out. Right, that, that's what my mind was. If it don't work out, I owe him money. Now, that's not how it works, but that's what my mind was. So I tried to um, leverage, I learned leverage more than anything, and I learned negotiation and trade, which I believe life is about the art of trade. I think that the most important, one of the most important things you can learn is the art of trade, like this for that, um, or this time for money, or whatever the thing may be. And um, I found a facility that wanted an athlete's presence. And so I said, hey, I talked to my guys, they were fine with it. I said, I will trade you use of their name image likeness for access to your facility. And so instead of securing funding, I secured a facility. And, and, I had, and when I say 
facility is a nice way of putting it, man. We were, <laughs> we were, we were up off 183. Um, I forget the, the exit, but we were up off 183 next to uh, the aquarium. And the wall that we shared was the snake wall. What do they feed snakes? Live mice? Do they want to die? So what would they do to not die? Cloth away wall. So 4 a.m. every single morning. Everybody asked me where the wind the day came. 4 a.m. every single morning, I would have to wake up and go pick up the mice traps that I set out along that wall the night before and then vacuum up rat poop. Y'all ever seen rat poop? It's... It, it looks like dog food almost. Yeah. It's like, all right, so, yeah, so every night I would lay out mice traps, and then every morning I would get there before we opened to pick them up and put them in this trap. Some of them not dead, so they just on the trap, just like, you know what I mean? And then I would vacuum, and some of them, every now and again, my man avoided the trap. So now you're chasing down, like, yeah, talk about fun. That's how the morning was starting. Yeah, no, I appreciate you telling this story because I think one of the things that I've experienced as, as somebody who's helped build a business is we all love the idea of like the exit, right? Like yeah. a romantic, sexy story of like people started in a garage and then Apple was built. Yeah. People skip over the stories where it's rats, where it's I lost all the money, yeah. where it's... And that's your reality. Like you don't get the chance to flip to the end of the story. Right? Like in that moment is your reality. So you're always facing that, that thing in your head of like, right, is this worth it? Should I try to do something else? Should I, am like I you, that guy? Yeah, am I the guy that I want to be or think I am? Like you, you're still fighting that. And, you know, this is just the way life works. There's no crowd, there's no applause, there's no this moment. This doesn't exist yet. It's just you, 4 a.m. And rats. That is the reality. Right. And you have to be able to fight through that shit and see where you want to be and keep working that direction regardless of where you're currently at. And, and I'm, I'm thankful for that experience because it, it really showed me that. It taught me, every day I would have to ask myself, how bad do you want it? Especially when it was those mornings where I was like, all right, he's alive and running. We open in 60 minutes. Do I still want this dream? How bad do you want it? Like, you know what I mean? So it, that's a part of it for me. Like, not everybody's story includes rats. Mine did. Right. But like, that's, that's a part of it. The that's metaphorical rat that we all have to get past in that moment. I mean, you've talked about imposter syndrome, the 100%. ability to fight through. There's a couple service members that I saw that joined us. Um, that's referred to in the services intestinal fortitude, that ability to push yourself beyond the known limit yeah. and then continue to chase that thing that you know is achievable, but you ain't got there yet. Yeah. yeah I mean, what are you willing to sacrifice? So like, let's talk about sacrifice. Yeah. You're winning. You got a family. You clearly love them. No, definitely. But this doesn't come without some sort of trade-off, right? We talked about time. Uh, tell us a little bit about the sacrifice that it takes in order to be a successful entrepreneur at this space and this time in Austin's history. I'll tell you... Um, I think me and my family's relationship got closer when I realized I had their support to continue chasing, even if it removed me physically from the family. And that was tough. My nephews were growing up. I'm not at a birthday. I'm not at a holiday. I'm not at a gathering. I am working. Right. Right? It, my mother's getting older. I'm not spending the time that I want to spend. I'm working. I'm, I'm trying to build. And I think it would have been, as tough as it was, I think it would have been tougher had I not had their support. Because they always kept reminding me, like, nah, we know what you're doing. Go do that. Go do it. We, we got you. You're fine. They're sending me pictures. They're FaceTiming me, trying to include me as much as they can because they know that I'm, no, nah, we, we see you, little bro. You need, us, they, you need us to come down there for anything? Right. You straight? I'm good. No, nah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm just doing this, this, and this. I'm trying to work on this. They... To this day, they call me. <laughs> they we call was, me. Hold on. We was interviewing for this just to get the just to get going, and I think you got three or four phone calls and a couple of texts. Yeah, from the fam. Yeah, was doing that's that. what I'm saying. Like, yeah, they, like they they hit me up. They care, 
And they hit me up like with ideas and all kind of stuff. Now some of this stuff be off the wall, man. But like, but but some of it is like, you hear something and you're like, ah, oh, that don't work for what he's saying. But if I apply it this way, like you know what I mean? Like right. these are people. Like collective is theirs just as much as it is mine. Like they've worked and it's on their mind. They, like the introductions that they try. Hey, I don't know if this introduction will help you or not, but I know this person that. Like they work, it's, 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 it's frontal for them. It's front space for them. It matters to them like because I'm involved with it. Absolutely. Right? But the, the sacrifice was, um, was everything. I always like to do this. This is a practice I like to do. All right, please just run with me for a second. All right. Um, so everybody in the room, close your eyes. Please, please, close your eyes. All right. Now, I want you guys to imagine um, the last nine years, right? Think of the family times, think of the memories, think of the parties, think of the group chat, the unmentionables. Think of like all of those experiences, right? All right, now open your eyes. While all of y'all were doing that, I was fucking working. That's what it took. I skipped that right. to do this. So that's powerful. And what we talked about and what I've also experienced is the fact that you can do all of that. You can show up. You can do the work. You can skip the parties. You don't have no unmentionables. You ain't having fun. None. You can have a fantastic idea, and it can meet the market, and the market can still say no thanks. Mm -hmm. So collective as we know it today yeah. is actually not the first iteration of this idea. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the first two iterations of this thing that have not achieved the same level of success? I learned valuable lessons in both. I tried to partner on a similar idea in 2016, 2016 going on 2017, and um, secured the funding. I, I didn't raise the funding. Uh, remember, I was still mastering the art of trade here. So um, that partner has secured the funding. And then I came on as a partner, and we were going to grow and build this thing. Now, some just crappy business practices end up happening, and the primary investor pulled the funding right before launch of the thing that we worked on for a while. That was the first one, where the rug kind of literally gets pulled underneath from underneath you, and it's, it has nothing to do with you. I specifically remember the investor's wife calling me and asking me to come to their office. And I was like, yeah, sure. And I, I drove out and, and went to the office and I sat down and she didn't have to do this. She was very kind. She says, hey, I want you to know we're going to go ahead and pull all the funding. So this isn't going to happen. But I want you to know it has nothing to do with you and I think you're great and you're going to figure it out. It'll work for you. You're great. As you're being fired <laughs> from your own thing. I was like, oh, shit. All right. Well, glad to know it had nothing to do with me. Um, <laughs> Still need this job, though. Yeah. Um, but they, people ask, well, damn, what'd you do? I kid you not. At this point, I'm kind of not numb, but I don't break easily. I'm, I'm, I'm starting, my arm is starting to get right. So I remember I drove up uh, to, not the domain. What's that little area next, next to the domain? Not, not quite the Arboretum. What's it called? I don't go north of the wall. I'm sorry. <laughs> Gateway. That's yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I, I sat down with like three of my boys, uh, and <laughs> we were having some drinks. And I was like, "Yo, y'all not gonna believe what happened." And I told them what happened, and the table got quiet. And this is how you know you got real friends. The table got quiet, and then they just bust out laughing. All three of, them. and I bust out laughing, and we all started laughing. And they're like, holy shit, are you serious? I was like, I'm so serious, bro. It just happened right now. And then it got quiet again. And my boy said, well, what you going to do? <laughs> you ain't got no job no more. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, and, and I, I did what, what I tend to do when, when things outside of my control happen. I go back to work. And so I went to Academy. And I purchased everything that I could and put it in a trunk. And we trained at public parks until we got kicked out. And, and that's just how that piece worked. Like, I, I'm not even going to waste time crying in overspilled milk. I'm, not, I'm literally, I'm not going to waste time trying to put broken pieces back together. I am going to keep working. I'm going to control what I can, which is how I react and my effort. 
So you went to work, you stayed at work. Tell us a little bit about version two. Version two was even more interesting. Um, I got a call. I, at this point, I was like, this is like 2017. And I got a call and, and uh, I wanted to open my own spot. I'm ready. I got the roster. The financials look pretty good. I'm a sole proprietor. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm running a show and holding a camera. I'm doing everything. Really quick, before I let you tell this one, you're the sole proprietor. We talked a little bit about ownership. Yeah. You had a saying. Oh, which, 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 which saying? Partnership is not ownership. Oh, don't ever get it twisted. Partnership is not ownership. I learned that the hard way. Didn't learn it the first time, had to learn it again. Partnership is not ownership. Okay? And I'm sorry, that don't always feel good to hear you again. It's the truth. Partnership is not ownership. I think anybody in the, in the crowd right now that's interested in starting their own venture or potentially midway through that journey, um, that's quite possibly one of the most palpable things I've heard anyone say about this thing. It's the truth. Um, I learned every, that the, the hardest way, uh, that lesson hurt because I believed in the partnership. Right. So, so that lesson hurt. Um, and it was, it was version two. Uh, I, uh, I was going to do my own facility, had the financials for it. A friend of mine, he was selling his facility because it just wasn't working out. And uh, I was living up north, and I was like, oh, man, this is perfect. Facility's maybe 15 minutes away from my house. This will work out. And then I got a call like, hey, hold on. Come, come see this other spot first. We think this could probably this potentially be a good fit. We can, we're dissolving a partnership, and we think you could slide in as our partner for this other side of it. And I went, and I, and I loved the space. And the community was cool, and it was new, and it was different. It was innovative. I, I love the supplement line. I love what they were trying to build. Um, and for the first time, I had like full support, support from media, support from other coaches on the staff, just support from the backing you get when you're dealing with bigger business, right? right. And, uh, and, and it was all good until it wasn't. Um, we did everything we were supposed to do. We grew that program. We got the supplements, NSF approved, that way they could be taken. NSF is the testing protocol for supplements for high level sports like uh, the NFL, MLB, NBA, et cetera. Um, we did what we were supposed to do there, right? The Banned Substance Control Group, we were approved by them as well. So we were clean product. We had a good training. We had great marketing. And it was growing. And it was fun. And, and we just we got to a point where um, I, I got to a level of partnership there. And you know, I, I started actually having a say and an input in the way the company would grow. Um, and then we started seeing things different, just where I wanted to take some stuff and where they wanted to take some stuff. And the extent of our contract was coming to an end. And, and this was a tough one, if I'm being honest. This one was tough because um, I did not realize how the board underneath me was changing. I was naive and blind to that. And so, at this time, I started teaching. I was teaching performance training. I, I, I currently, I've taught in five countries in 23 different states. At this time, I was in Italy teaching. And um, while I was gone, it's a seven-hour time difference, right? right? So while I'm gone, it's like seven in the evening there. I've been teaching all day. I'm tired. Uh, I got a call from one of my athletes. And he, uh, he goes, Jay. I said, like, what's up? He said, yo, everything good? Uh, what you mean? Yeah, it was until you said that. What you, what, what's going on? <laughs> and then he says, um, man, I just got a call from the company. They, um, they were asking, would I still be involved if you weren't? Hmm. Hey, we just figured some stuff out. It's all good. Contract is coming to an end. You know how it goes. Negotiation. You good. I'll see y'all when I get back. Eight minutes later, I got another call from a, a different athlete. Five minutes after him. Five minutes after him. And uh, I realized what was happening. Yep. And I realized there's nothing I can do. I'm on the other side of the world. <laughs> so it was like, yikes. How am I even going to defend this? Um, and and I, I mean... Oh, my gosh. I mean, I'm looking out on the Amalfi Coast, which is probably the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life, and I can't even enjoy it. 
because I'm I'm burning up. I'm, I can't wait to get back to Austin. Yeah, there's a hostile takeover. Ah, I can't I can't wait to get back to Austin. Um, and I and I'll tell you this. This is the part that really threw me off. This is the part that really threw me off. I'm being super honest here. Is I realized it was too late, but I realized how I contributed, how this had been planned, and I didn't even see it. And it was simple that I was asked for the address and phone numbers of the athlete roster so that they could send out care packages on my behalf. That's not what the fucking address was for, and that's not what the phone number was for. I got your whole team. And my, I didn't, I didn't, I'm taking, I was naive. I was naive. But um, anyways, got back, and you can imagine what happened with that partnership. And uh, it was tough because I was putting this thing called NFL Elite Week together, and this was only my, my third run at it. And we had just started to gain some traction, which I wanted to put together a week-long kind of mastermind for NFL athletes where players from different teams could all come to Austin. We could get like a real cool Airbnb. They stay at the Airbnb. We just pick each other's brains. We help each other grow. Because at the end of the day, NFL is a big business. You're not married to a team. You can and will be traded you need to learn from your peers. Right. Like you you got to understand like that side of it. And this was 11 days before that kickoff. So I'm like, I don't, now I don't have a facility. Like everything that I had support-wise from a big business was now, it doesn't exist. And I remember I was driving home and my Apple Watch said, uh, take a breath. And I was <laughs> Literally, I said, that's why that shit happens. Like, <laughs> like you, you know what I mean? Like, I had never experienced anxiety before. Right. And that was the first time I experienced anxiety. And, like, it used to annoy me when the Apple Watch was like, you want to take a breath? I was like, no, bro. Like, you, you know what I mean? But this time I'm driving, and it said, take a breath. And I was like, you're right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and do that. <laughs> And I, I did the take a breath thing for like hours. Like every time it went, I just did it again. It just did it again. And um, I remember getting home and thinking like, all right, what the fuck am I going to do? And um, <laughs> I went to work. I, I went back to academy. I went back to academy and, and loaded it up. I brought $15,000 worth of equipment from academy. All right. And I went from like one in, I was looking at the P&L on how this could be a great, and I remember I prayed and just said, um, I don't care if I make a dollar on this. I want this to be the best damn camp they've ever experienced. I don't care if I lose money. I want this to be the best experience they've ever had. And then I, I went on Google and I just looked up different facilities in Austin that has some type of performance arm. And um, I found one that was real cool that I thought would work. It was, um, it's right here on East Riverside. What's the name of it? What's the name of it? Facility on East Riverside, Sandy. Athletic Outcomes, married couple, phenomenal people, phenomenal people, great people. And I, I, we worked out a number. I paid them everything up front, told them I'd give them more media attention they could ever dream of, and that's exactly what we did. Tell me a little bit about that first group of Elite Week athletes. Oh, man. So they came in, and, and you got to remember, when they left, it was at this massive facility. And then when they came back, it was at this smaller kind of mom and pop. And they were like, business all right, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, no, it's good. It's good. Don't worry about it. We're working on this thing. Just go, go get stretched. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, no, I, when I look back on that, like, and this is kind of like a life lesson. It's like some stuff happens that's out of your control, and it just happens. But how do you respond? What's your... Do you fight or flight? Like, what is your response? That is going to determine the course of your life more than what's actually happening to you or what's happening around you. Because we're a little bit arrogant in saying happening to you. You think you're that special? It just happened. It just happened, period. It's a fact. It happened, period. What next? What next? And, and that, was one of, um, that was one of the best camps we had, man. It was tough on me physically. Cause I was doing everything financially too. Yeah, financially it was even tougher. I was back in the speedy loan spot. I was like, God, this interest rate, man. I'm talking. By this time, I know the guy by name. I'm like, Steve, <laughs> you can't do better than 18 like, percent. Yeah, it's friends. bad. It's bad. He's like, Ah, right, you're back, like, Steve. But um, but no, we 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 worked that piece out, 
Uh, we had an amazing summer, and and then business started. <laughs> that's what when you when you earlier when we first started, you were talking about like overnight success. And in the back of my mind, I was like, yeah, that's what it was. Like, overnight over yeah, ten years. Yeah, it was a it was a long ten year night. Is what it was. Yeah. But um, no, we had a great, we had an amazing camp, and ESPN actually came down, and they acknowledged the camp, and it worked out because. Um, Athletic Outcomes got a lot of like national exposure, and I was so happy and proud that they got that because they they did not know me and opened up their doors. Just and I needed that. I needed that at that moment. You know what I mean? So uh, we got a lot of national exposure, and then I was like, okay, let's get to it. Let's let's start doing like let's really start doing it. Uh, I I end up investing in Ladder, which was a uh, a tech platform, an online tech platform that I thought was going to be really interesting. And I thought that they were a one-to-one -one kind of training platform, almost like the Tinder of training. They were trying to connect coaches to clients based off of a series of questions and tests. And I was like, hey, this is cool, but it ain't that many good coaches in the world. You got more people than you got good coaches. So you got to figure out how to go from one-to-one to one-to-many. One to mm -hmm. And so we piloted this uh, train like a pro kind of pilot thing that we did where we um, – I wrote out all the workouts and made them available. And I just made what our programming was for the pros available for everybody on the app to participate with us. And then we streamed it live. And the success rate shot up. And now we changed some of what that structure is. Um, it's pre-Peloton. This is, yeah, yeah. And it, and it worked out. It, it, that, that worked out. And, and then... Um, a lady named Natasha Swan was over all of the talent recruitment for Lifetime Corporate, Lifetime Fitness Corporate, and she reached out to me. And by this time, I have, you know, I, I had some, a little bit of success by this time. Um, I had written the Vertimax training platform that was being sold around the world. I had uh, had a successful venture with Ladder. We had um, an exit already. Um, you know, Two, three exits in the we, we had, uh, we had, we had some success. We had some success. Uh, pattern recognition is how they refer to that in the business. <laughs> People trust you enough to give you their money now. That, and that's, and that's where it was, right? That's you exactly got to go see Steve was. this time. That's right. I, I ain't seen Steve since I ain't going back there. I will not be back at speedy loans. All right. If I run into Steve, it's going to be at like target or something. I'm not going to his place of work, but, um, all of that to say, uh, we lifetime we wanted to introduce well they wanted to introduce they were having trouble with their group fitness class attendance nationwide and they were trying to find a solve and they were like listen our attendance rate is dropping month over month year over year we have to do something to spice it up we've done surveys they had like they got hundreds of facilities. They got so many facilities, right? They done surveys and they found out that their member base really enjoyed being pushed like an athlete. So uh, we, we wanted to create a general fitness group training program that was athlete inspired, right? And I flew to Minnesota where their headquarters is and I, I sat down with Ifonda Sproles, who's like the number two. And I mean, we wrote up the contract. We did everything the right way. And by this time, I'm starting to, I'm finally, now mind you, I'm eight years in at this point, seven, eight years in, and I'm finally starting to do good business. You know, like, I'm a big, big, big advocate of, hey, while we love each other and we're feeling great about each other, let's get everything on paper. Yeah, let's paper this up. Let's get it off. We, listen, we'll go eat. We'll do it all. We'll, but let's get it on paper, right? And, and making sure that the paper, I'm okay with it. I'm, right. I'm feel protected. I feel good with it. And then some of this, like some of these hurdles I had to overcome, some stuff started actually happening directly in my favor. Uh, one of them being the way we structured the contract. I can I can talk on it now. I absolutely love this. All right, the way we structured the contract. How are we doing on time, D? Oh, okay. I'll make it quick, D. I'll make it quick. I want to I want to get to two other questions, yes. and I want to open it up to see if there's any folks because I know a lot of people want, got some questions about. I'll make this quick. This is I just absolutely love that this happened. Um, the way we structured the contract, I was basically paid up front for all of the programming that I wrote out for their program um, for that program, and then we began to roll it out. We did that in the Q4 of 2019. You know what happened in Q1 of 2020? 
Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with the thing happened. It happened to all of us. The Pando. So then they had to furlough the contract. They had to they furloughed me and cut the contract. I, I didn't have to return that. You were already paid. <laughs> Contractually. And I kept the program. Hey. Well, look, yeah, that's cool. Like, you know what I mean? But um, and then at the same time, ladder shot up because nobody can train in person anymore. They're all doing virtual training. Right. Now so virtual training is the, the now necessity, virtu- it's the standard. Exactly. So now you have both of these things shoot off at the same people are talking talking about. How'd you know to do ladder? I was like, bro, I didn't. Like, I was like, I didn't. I thought it was a good idea seven months ago. It's a better idea now. Like, um, Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Better to be lucky than good. But no, we did that. And that's actually, during that process is actually when I met my co-founder, Devin Lowe. I met him. He was uh, managing um, acquisitions and strategic partnerships on behalf of Lifetime. And he was present, well, placed at the Lifetime right on 5th and Lamar. And... Um, I didn't, I wasn't going to work there or do anything there. So they was like, you want an office? I was like, no, I'm good. I just, whatever you got. And so literally the way me and you are sitting, if you can imagine a square table, I would be in his office pinning all of the programs. And when you sit and spend that much time with somebody, you begin to talk. Absolutely. And we started to ideate on um, what eventually became collective. Okay. Yeah. So here we are. To you. Yeah, let's clap for that one. Collective is here. <laughs> collective is here. So the first gym opens on what date? We started working on the first gym in 2020. Okay. Um, which is the one here on 200 Academy. One block over. Go check right, it out. Right next door. You guys are more than welcome. We can walk over there after this. You're more than welcome. We can all go. But no, we started working on that in 2020. Um, most important thing we did was recruit the right people. And, and thankfully, I've been in Austin a long time now been in this field for a long time, so it was like I kind of knew who I had in mind for some of this stuff. But we started working on it in 2020. We opened the actual doors and cut on dues uh, March 1st of 2022. Okay, fantastic. So two years, another overnight success. Yeah, another overnight success. <laughs> Look at me, full of them. Overnight. <laughs> Dream it up, we'll have it tomorrow. Dream it up, it's fine. But I, um, we know you. The theme here is relentless work. Just yep. follow up, follow through. Yep. This ain't the only thing you're doing. What's next? I'll say this, we, um, we, open that, we open those doors, like truly open for business, March 1 of this year, and September 1 of this year, we were in the green, and so, four wall EBITDA profitability, yeah, hard to achieve, so that was, that was tough, but I you know we're learning what you have to do if you're going to do any kind of business at, a, at, a, at the pace you want to do it at, you got to exist in two spaces, and we have to operate in the now and exist in the future. So we had already started building, looking for and now building number two, um, <clears throat> which we will be in North Austin, uh, January 1 of next year, opening. For and that. one. So, that's yeah. that's and, amazing. Yeah, that's fine. It's a very that's short timeline. Fun. Yeah, I mean, hey, hey, short compared to what, right? Hey. Yeah, yeah. There we go. No, that was going to be fun. I'm going to try to open it up some some questions. Yes, but for sure. I want to I wanna leave... I want to give you the opportunity, if you were to have somebody take one thing away from this conversation tonight, one thing that you wanted them to learn about your journey, where you started versus where you're at now, what would you distill that down to? One? Just one. <laughs> Got to get to people one. I don't want to tell you no cliche shit. Like hard work? Yeah, of course, right? This is really special to me. I'm not special to it. This is principle driven and anybody can apply it. Anybody. To whatever it is that you're doing. Don't want you thinking like I'm special or I did something special. I just didn't quit. So if you can take one thing away, don't quit. Whatever it is. Do not quit. Just don't quit. A lot of this game is just being the last one standing. Don't quit. That's, yeah, I get, I'm starting to get upset. Oh, like that's, <laughs> you mad at it. That's because, like, bro, it's like, they want us to quit, man. They, they, they want you to quit. They want you to quit. 
They want you to quit. You don't, just don't quit. Don't quit, okay. Um, D, can we take some questions from the crowd? Everybody's locked in. Okay, I'm gonna get you right here, gentlemen, in the, in the black hat. Well, that actually happened. The worst thing out of the worst thing for me at Carmax, my time at Carmax, other than them little ass shorts in the hot summer, it was stick. I, I mean, I had running back legs, man. Like it was bad. But the worst thing was somebody to recognize me. Oh, you were. Ugh, it hurt every time. You out there in hoochie daddy shorts? Uh, hoochie daddy short. <laughs> left my name tag today. Like, yeah, it's you know. But so, um, yeah. So eventually, and my brother really helped me with this a lot, which is why I was so thankful that he was back in my life at that time. That was probably my most vulnerable, right? And he reminded me that I'm more than my work. My contribution to this world is not selling cars and it's not scoring touchdowns. It's who I am. And so um, believing in me again more than what I do was probably what I turned to and even what I live by now. Like, I love Collective, but yeah, when it's time for Baby Shark with my daughter, Collective will be on hold forever. And that's, I'm not my work. And, and I think that, especially men, I think we need to do a little bit better job of allowing us to detach our, our value away from what we do. It's the first question we ask a man when we meet him. What do you do? It's the very first thing we ask. And you know, because of that, we attach so much of our worth to work. So uh, actively trying to distinguish the two. Thank you so much for the fantastic question. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am, at the bar. I love hearing about who your family was, where you are right now. Um, are there other people in your life that you still are in touch with? Um, yeah. Um, Benny Wiley, the head strength coach for the University of Southern California. Uh, what did they say? Fight on? Fight on. Um, he was actually the person to originally tell me that considered his field. And every step along the way, I mean, we didn't have time to really get into him. Um, he offered me a job at two different Division I universities. And I, and I turned them both down because I just felt like that was, one, the easy way out. And then, two, I, I didn't want to work for an institution or a team. I wanted to stay, stay private sector so that I could grow and have the athlete's individual best interest in mind. But Benny was probably the person that I've stayed super close to over all the years. And uh, if I had to ask somebody for advice, I would ask Benny. Benny's not just some coach. No. Benny's a legend. Yes, he is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a legend. You turned him down NBA, twice? Hey, this is the thing. Yeah, you turned him down twice. You turned him down twice. It's okay. I took, he was the first university that I did the cane shoe deal with. I flew to California, sat down in his office, explained the recovery shoe to him, told him this is going to blow up. He jumped right on it. I said, see, I get that to you first, Benny. Hey, I get that to you for anybody else. Okay. Yeah, but right um, no, Benny Wiley, he's a man. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, dead center at the bar, yes. I just thought about me at 23. <laughs> Did I tell you what I was doing on Fifth Street? What are you talking about? Was, uh, give me the money. Like, I, I, when you said 10 mil, unless you was going to say like a different number or a chop off a limb, then I'm taking the 10 mil. <laughs> but that was me at 23. That was me at 23. Um, yeah, I, I've enjoyed, and this, I know there's gonna be somebody in the crowd, rightfully so, is probably going to say bullshit. But... I've enjoyed the last 10 so much, and if I'm being super honest, we'll make more than that when it's all said and done. So I, I, I can't trade this journey. 50 or the next 
<laughs> Thanks, Prashant. Get the bag. Get the bag. Uh, we probably got time for one or two more. Yes, the family for show. Sure. Yes, sir. Why would you do that? <laughs> you knew he was going to. Question. Yeah. It is a fantastic um, question. <laughs> it was a lot of explicits in there, honestly. It was a lot of explicits in there. But what he basically told me is the same things that make you that made you a great ball player still exist. And you either going to let them lie dormant or you're going to apply them to what's next. But the same skill set, the same mentality, the same work ethic, the same char charisma, the same energy, all of that is still there. Don't waste it. It just doesn't exist in this vertical anymore. Apply it. But it was a lot of explicits in between. <laughs> We're not going to capture that sound bite today. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask one, and then I'm going to put it back to the crowd for the very last one of the evening. But um, you talked about building a business during the pandemic at a time where everybody was looking at socioeconomic downturn, you decided to build a four wall physical space. That was fun. And, and you're able to execute that at a time where entering the market in Austin, Texas, especially as a minority leader, had to have been one of the most difficult things to do at this moment in history. Right. One, that decision is crazy as hell. I appreciate you for that. Um, tell me a little bit about your experience as a black founder in this city at this time. I, I recognize that I have it different in the sense of I've been here a long time. And this city and the people here have seen, uh, uh, collective is new. I'm not new. So I was embraced more than anything and, they, and was able to completely be myself. And for me, that's one of the biggest blessings that is a part of my entire life is that I'm able to do this thing in a way that's authentic to me. I'm not trying to fit a mold of what this should look like. Right. I'm not trying to sound how, this should, how it should sound, I'm not, none of it. I get an opportunity to really contribute to this idea that people are getting around and, and finding value in as me, showing up as me. So that, that's been special. And then doing it in 2020, um, man, hard, <laughs> not easy. Yeah. Supply chain was a battle. It was, a, and then I just had this very great idea of like, oh, let's order all our custom equipment from London. Like, <laughs> that'll work out. Oh, it was the dumbest thing I ever did. It wasn't, it wasn't just the pandemic, then it was the Suez Canal. You just wasn't going to get here. No, I know, but like I told you, I traveled and taught. So I was in the UK. I was in London. I seen, like, I was teaching at this space, and it had this Watson equipment group, and they did this real sleek custom equipment. And I was like, we got to have that. We, like, that's a differentiator. That's something that's, that stands out, right? And then, like, I'm on the phone with these people. They're telling me four weeks. I'm looking on the little tracker thing. I'm like, how is that still in the middle of the ocean? Like, you, you know what I mean? But it's, it's not moving. It's not moving at all. But um, I had learned from prior experiences. For 2020, I wasn't afraid, right? Uh, only, I had already went through being afraid to start. Right. At, at this point, I was, more, I was responsible. My daughter was born in 2020. She was born May 14, 2020. So we're talking like kind of the height of this thing, right? So I'm being responsible. I'm cleaning. I'm, I'm running a full NFL offseason out of my garage. Like all that equipment that got purchased from Academy didn't go to waste. Like I'm running a full NFL offseason out of my garage. I'm running it in smaller groups, groups of four from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Just... Boom, boom, so, boom, boom, all day, right? Using the public park in the neighborhood. It was cool. I saved a lot of gas money. I didn't have to drive much, but it was a lot of work. And then when we decided we were going to do collective, um, you got to remember, we didn't have any business history. So then to be able to secure this building in this zip code was not easy at all. Right. And if we didn't strike when we did, we don't have that building. That's the truth. They Owners couldn't give they, they couldn't give buildings away and you can't kick people out it's literally it was it, it was probably the craziest thing that we've seen right and it, and ultimately one conversation i had with my mother uh specifically was i said at the end of this thing there will be winners and there will be losers right 
and whatever we believe is going to happen, either we believe this is the end of the world and we should panic, or we believe that this is not the end of the world and we should lock in. And we decided to lock in, we went after it with the building and, and things got scarce there in the beginning, in the middle, and even a little bit more in the middle, but the world's not over and here we are going into 2023 talking about facility two. Absolutely, facts. Because we talk about a lot in this industry, um, you know, the people putting your dream on hold. Just mm -hmm. wait. Wait for the market conditions to improve. Yeah. And had you done that, you probably wouldn't be able to buy back into the same building that you're in right now today. Not at all. So for all you entrepreneurs out there, sometimes it's just keep pressing through. Keep going. Do what you can with what you have. Get started now. Like there's no time like right now. Get started now. Don't wait for perfect conditions. They don't exist. Right. Get started right now. Fantastic. One last question to the crowd. I'm going to stick with the family again. We got to y'all. Hold up. I'm, Hell, did, Mama, Mama, did you do, vet do this question? For you? She said stop immediately. Talk about that dark place. Yeah, it was, a, it was a foundation. Like I said, like we all here now, we care about the thing that we're building and we're doing now, but that space that he's talking about, that that is the the rat poop. That is the, you know, she called me in that office and told me, hey, you don't have a job. That, the check you got Friday was your last one. That space right there, like those are the moments where it can be pretty dark. And ultimately, like, that space makes you or breaks you. Like, that's it. Like, the, those moments happen, and only you either come out stronger or you were broken. That's it. Like, that's where the story ends for you for that thing. Or it made you rose a little up. bit stronger. You rose up. So, for me, that space that you describe in T, that, that was a foundation. That was, honestly, it, like, not from an arrogant standpoint either. It made me get to this, this, space where will I have setbacks? Yes. I'll never fail. And and I really believe that. Yeah. There's like failure is no longer even on my mind. It's really just weighing what things cost on a scale of trade, making my mind up if I if I'm willing to give that thing what it deserves and what it costs. And then execution. And then obviously execution is going to, how well we execute is going to determine how efficient we are with the success. But the success is coming regardless. There it is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all so much for being so engaged and locked in. <laughs> Jeremy Hill. Thank you, guys. Don't forget to tip your bartenders. Take care of the people that took care of you. And uh, we hope to see you all out there tonight.